Thank you very much, Fred. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you all for coming to attend this. Hopefully, this will be a fun panel. But I'm, I, it's my feeling this is the most important panel, because this is where you're going to hear from the operators. And you're going to get a sense of uh, how they view where we're headed off into the future. Um, innovation in an era of austerity. Uh, what capabilities do we need in a non-permissive environment? That's the theme of this conference we're having. And specifically, this panel is, how do the operators feel about that? Uh, the environment. I'm going to start off with just a quick overview of, of the environment that, that the panelists are going to be talking to. In other words, what do they think of operations in this environment? Uh, as everybody knows, we're in a sine wave. I've been in, I joined in 1969. Uh, I watched this go from 69 into the late 70s, come back up in the 80s, go back down in the mid 90s, come back up in the 2000s, and we're in a position now of coming back down. When I say up and down, I'm referring to the budgetary pressures that are on our sailors, soldiers, marine, airmen, and coast guard men forward. And so you find that in this environment, as we're starting on the backside of that curve, what does it mean to our operators? So what are the changes? Well, the changes from World War II, Korea, Vietnam, Desert Storm, and the end of the Cold War, the, uh, a couple of the major changes are, the first one is we're an all-volunteer force. And that might have been true in Desert Storm, the end of the Cold War, but we are established as an all-volunteer force all the way through our commanders. And so you have a view there of, of a, a decision that can be made by folks who see and sit in the military as the environment, uh, as it starts to change and you have less funding available to you. The next one is we have a continued war, fire, war fighting requirement. Uh, in the World War II, at the end of Korea, even at the end of Vietnam, and at the end of the Cold War, when Desert Storm ended, there was a sense that there was the end of the conflict. I'll tell you that there is not an end of the conflict as we leave Afghanistan. And the associated with that is the associated training and, and operation and maintenance money that's going to be required to fund that. And lastly, and one that we probably don't think about unless we think about it and look closely at it, at each one of those war, war I'll call them wars, each, each one of those exercises we went through, there was a fairly large R&D and acquisition program that was engendered by that evolution, whether it was Korea or Korea is where our, our large deck aircraft carriers came out of a Navy, that's where I live, but that's where we started building a Forrestal class carrier out of World War II. Uh, during World War II, we built the you know, P-51, the Essex class carriers. As we came out of Vietnam, we had built an awful lot of new platforms we were flying in Vietnam. As we, came out of the, as we came out of the Cold War, we were bringing forward a lot of platforms that went into the interim period. There was not a lot of platforms that were designed and built during this time frame. There wasn't a lot of R&D that, that I will say from the perspective across the force. And so you're not carrying as much capital stuff with you. Instead, you're carrying a lot you need to buy. And so I think yesterday, I think the, this morning, we heard uh, Admiral Branch talk about how exciting it is for the Navy to be transitioning its forces in now into new aircraft. When you think about it, that requires, the transition requires you have to buy the new aircraft. So this, this is important because those other conflicts, we had a lot of those things we bought during the conflict for the conflict. So there's, there's expenditures required for the capability you want to have. There's an all-volunteer force that you want to keep motivated and keep in the force. And I think those two things combined is going to make this a fairly challenging time frame. And lastly, we're struggling to define, and I think that occurred in all of these evolutions, a national security strategy. What does our strategy look like as we enter this new time frame? Um, it's unstable, it's dangerous. Um, as we saw, as we left World War II, we entered the war in Korea because of a strategy discussion that didn't go all that well, so it's important that we understand what our strategy is going to be like in this new environment. The one thing that's the same in every single one of those environments I talked about is the folks who are working for us, our sailors, our soldiers, our Marine, our Coast Guard men, and our airmen, the honor and integrity, uh, and their desire and willingness to be ready for the fight. So. Uh, I'd like to talk about a couple of the issues for this panel. The first one is, um, and I'm going to go through these rather quickly, uh, when you look at this new environment, there's the issue of equipment, whether it's new, it's modernized, it's sustained, uh, and the capacity in addition to the capability to pace or meet the threat. The all-volunteer force, how do you deployments, pay, benefits, quality of life, morale, force size and structure, combat readiness, how do you sustain combat readiness in this environment? And then lastly, deployments. The frequency, rotations, training, quality of service. 
So that kind of covers all of the things that, that you would need to be thinking about as you looked at this new environment. So what I'd like to do now is I'd like to introduce the panel to you. So, so real quick, the agenda. I'm going to introduce each one of the panel members. I'm going to ask them to talk a little bit about a subject or a theme that they would like to discuss. And then we'll move down to the next panel member. This should take us a little bit of time. My guess is probably about 20 minutes. But I guarantee you, all of you here, I'm going to save 20 minutes at the end of this discussion for you to ask questions. So I would ask that you would think about as they're talking, is there something that you would like to hear from the operators, whatever service it might be, uh, to be able to try to explain or to help you understand how they view this environment that they're in. Sitting next to me is Captain Clem, I'm sorry, Glenn, Captain Glenn Berdella, uh, has a Bachelor of Science from DeSalle, uh, 2005, was uh, commissioned through TBS and went on to be a comm officer in 2007, um, deployed to Iraq with TUMEF, uh, he was part of the 8th Com, uh, and uh, he went there about 2009. Came back, uh, joined the 26th Mu as a platoon commander, uh, deployed to Pakistan, Afghanistan, and Libya for the 26th Mu in 2010. Uh, currently at Mar4 uh, Com uh, as the aide de camp for the G6. Uh, there's a couple of things that you're, I'm going to mention in each one of these. They all have something very unique about them. And last year. Uh, AFCA recognized Glenn uh, as a uh, leadership award for the Copernicus Award last year. So um, an exceptional individual. And I asked him, I said, why did you join the Marine Corps? You know, what, what got you in the service and what we do? And he mentioned his uncle, uh, Colonel Rizzio, uh, United States Marine Corps, as being his, his inspiration. So uh, Glenn, please. Thank you, sir. What does operating in a new environment mean to a company grade officer in the Marine Corps? What is this new, or some would say old, environment? Is the Navy and Marine Corps team needing to be forward deployed aboard naval shipping in order to respond to a crisis anytime, anywhere? We don't get to pick where we go. We go to where the crisis is. During the last 12 years of war, new ARGs have been deploying across the globe. Navy and the Marine Corps has performed over 120 amphibious operations over the past 12 years. Some examples include Task Force 58, early days in Afghanistan, Task Force Tarawa in Iraq, and various NEOs, HADR, and TRAPS. So what is the problem? The problem is that we don't have enough ships to meet the global demand of all the COCOMs. So what's the so what? Here's an example of when you have a MUARG sitting off the coast ready to respond. 22 March 2011, Libya. Within 30 minutes of a United States Air Force F-15 crash, 26 Mu and Kearsarge ARG launched their trap QRF off the Kearsarge within 45 minutes of launching and had recovered the downed Air Force pilot. Fast forward to 11 September 2012, Libya, same country. No Mu ARG in the Mediterranean to respond to the attack on our consulate in Benghazi. This led to the DOD pushing for a new norm, a crisis response across all the services. Crisis response means the higher state of training readiness for all of the services. For most of us, all we have known is war with lots of money and endless resources. With deployments to Iraq and Afghanistan, we had predictable unit rotations. We knew the location we were deploying to. We knew the dates. We knew the, the culture of the enemy. We also knew the enemy for the most part. So how do we train for crisis response with reduced budgets and a higher level of uncertainty that we've seen in the past 12 years deploying to Iraq and Afghanistan? We need to continue to focus on the basics. This includes weapons training, TTPs and SOPs, accountability, and rehearsals, rehearsals, rehearsals. We need to make sure our Marines have realistic, hard training so they're able to operate during the chaos. We need to ensure that our Marines have balanced excellence. This is both professional and family readiness as well. Lastly, we need to make sure that we have an intellectually trained force that learns from history. This will help us hedge from the decrease in live training due to uh, decrease in budgets. The end state is a balanced, forward deployed naval force that can accomplish come as you are operations that will set the conditions for a follow on joint and coalition force. Thank you, Glenn. Appreciate it. Uh, Lieutenant Commander Paul Kasudi is next. Uh, Paul's sitting in the second to my right. Bachelor of Science for Vanderbilt uh, in 2002. Uh, first went to the Donald Cook 
Uh, I was his battle group commander when he was on board the battle. We were just talking about being shipmates back then. Went from there to uh, commander of squadron uh, six as assistant in six uh, when they went around in anti-piracy operations. Uh, Expeditionary Security Group 1 on the SWIFT in the Caribbean, if you're familiar with the HSV-2, which was our high-speed uh, ship. Uh, went to the War College uh, at the Navy. Uh, USS uh, Fitzgerald is a chief engineer, and USS Vela Gulf is a combat systems officer, which is where he is now. Uh, he was a Desron 15 JO Tactician of the Year in 2010, Navy Marine Corps Society Leadership Award in 2011, and the Air Land, make that the Surf Land, uh, Surface Warfare Officer of the Year in 2012. Um, you can tell Paul's done a lot and has been very successful. And I asked him, I said, Paul, what motivated you to join this as a Surface Warfare Officer? He basically told me, again, came from family. Uh, his, his dad was an engine man in the Italian Navy. Uh, went from there to be an engineer in, on cruise liners, but spent a lot of his time at sea as an engine man. And his dedication to the service as others is what motivated him to join our profession. So if I could, uh, Paul, your turn. Sir, thank you. Um, topic I looked at is our people. I think as, as a midshipman and an ensign, the thing that was always impressed upon us is taking care of your people. So this is not a controversial topic at all. But uh, finishing up three years as a department head now, I'm realizing more and more just how important that is at the end of the day. Uh, if it's an engine, a system, whatever it may be, we can get technicians on board, buy parts, FedEx them, whatever, and we'll fix it. But you lose a person uh, that could drastically affect our readiness, especially on a small scale level of a small ship, 270 people, uh, limited training, NECs available. It, it makes it more and more difficult to uh, lose even one sailor. Um, I think the way to get around this, or the way to attack it at least, is active communications uh, for commanders, department heads on down from a top-down view that uh, a lot of face-to-face -face communications, being honest up front. Um, I'm coming from, as the Admiral mentioned, uh, Seventh Fleet where a lot of things were short notice, pulling on a Thursday, underway on a Sunday morning. So we, we felt that a lot out there, but in one respect it was easier. A lot of, People were either single, had a rock-solid family care plan, things like that, so they expected it, they knew it was coming. We we're going out to perform a real mission. Uh, it's a little bit harder now that I came back to the States uh, to execute this and to you know, jerk people around. It, it really has an impact on not only that sailor, but their performance at work, their family life at home. So it's becoming more and more important. I'm seeing, of course, I'm learning this at the end of three years, not, not once I started it. But um, I think the other part is the family. Uh, it goes into having good ombudsmen, a uh, good family readiness group, uh, being ready to pull the trigger on those items if, if they're not uh, up to snuff and maybe finding somebody new. Uh, but it goes beyond that and having good morale at the command. Um, I, I know my friends say, I'm, you could be at home with the ombudsman on speed dial and it doesn't really matter if you have three screaming kids, you have to get to work, you have to do this, you have to do that. I think that's where the bigger community of a ship or any unit comes into play. You have to build an environment where people want to work with each other, families want to be a part of each other's lives and, and that will help them out more so than uh, the, the PTA version of the family readiness group ever could. Um, so more and more, I think uh, we need to be looked at as a family, taking care of other families. Uh, that's the only way that we'll be able to meet these tougher deployment schedules, tougher training cycles. With less money, that means compressed schedules. So it, it's going to have to be frank, honest discussions with our sailors and spread that out to our families. OK. Thank you very much, Paul. Uh, next, uh, two down from my right, Lieutenant Trey Floche. Uh, Trey comes to us uh, with a long career. He started in 1992. Uh, when I first saw that, I thought maybe that was a misprint, but then I realized this isn't a junior officer panel, this is an operator's panel. Trey started in 92 uh, as an enlisted man. He joined as a quartermaster, um, and he spent uh, the next uh, 12 years in the enlisted force of the United States Coast Guard. Uh, spent time in the U.S. Uh, US Coast Guard Cutter Dependable, 
um, and, and several other places, ending up in Atlantic City, New Jersey, at the uh, air station there. He went off to OCS uh, at that point through the Coast Guard uh, in 2004, was commissioned, and went off to be the deck watch officer on the Ox Haley. And then he started uh, a series of commanding officer tours. He was a CEO of the Marlin, uh, CEO of the Barnoff, and the CEO of Block Island, is, is where he is currently located. And in the middle of that, he spent some time as a duty officer in the 5th District, and while he was there, he got his BS at Excelsior in 2010. Uh, Trey, uh, Trey is all about service. I, I asked him, I said, tell me a little bit about yourself. And the story he told me I thought was, was kind of fascinating. Um, first of all, when he was enlisted, he was uh, nominated for uh, SAR Controller of the Year. Uh, it was all about people, search and rescue. And while he was in Atlantic City, he went ahead and volunteered to the Volunteer Fire Department in town. And then while he was a Volunteer Fire Department in town, he decided to take that one step further and uh, help them answer the phones for the, for the 911 calls. And he realized in his own city, as a matter of service to the folks in that town, this is all volunteer stuff, what it took to take all the different aspects <coughs> that it would take to help, his, to help the people there, how to coordinate them, how to get the right people on the phone, and how to set it up. And all those things he was able to take back into the Coast Guard. So I, I was, uh, it, was, it was pretty neat to see a guy with that kind of background, with the long and distinguished career he's had up to this point, but at the same time, all the commanding officer tours he's had and able to relate all that to the people who work for him. So if I could, with that introduction, uh, Trey, I'd like to hand it over to you for your comments. Thank you, Admiral. I took a, uh, a, a little bit extra from what uh, Paul talked about on the, the people aspect. Um, as a commanding officer on a Coast Guard cutter right now, the, uh, the Coast Guard is experiencing record high recruiting efforts and almost to the point we're seeing a lot of log jam of our junior enlisted folks of not being able to, to move forward and, and, and being advanced. So, so the question that I'm, uh, I'm posing is, how can frontline leaders keep their people motivated during these times of austerity and cutbacks? Uh, obviously, the current financial crisis and sequestration efforts are being, beginning to affect the military personnel more and more. Uh, all branches are experiencing record high recruiting statistics to the point there are more applicants then there are available boot uh, billets at boot camp. Uh, those billets are decreasing year by year. For the Coast Guard, uh, we are a force of about 42,000 active duty members uh, with an 8,000 reserve force as well. Um, we are gonna recruit 1,500 people for fiscal year 13. Uh, fiscal for, uh, for FY14, we're expected to only take in 1,000 people. Uh, four years ago, we were bringing in triple this number of people. Uh, it's extremely competitive getting the Coast Guard right now uh, because of the economy. Uh, unemployment, unemployment rates are uh, driving factors for uh, pushing people to our recruiting doors um, and people's desire for a stable deployment with, uh, with benefits. Um, I, uh, I called the uh, chief recruiter down in uh, Raleigh, North Carolina a couple of days ago, spoke to her, um, and, and she told me what the, the average recruit is that's coming through her door right now. Uh, first off, that person is, uh, is 22 years old, no longer is the... Uh, uh, an 18-year-old kid, uh, you know, coming through boot camp. When I went through boot camp in 1992, um, I can remember only having one person in my boot camp company out of about 50 people uh, who is older than 21. Um, also, uh, that person is uh, has two or more years of college, and typically more on the, the more side of college. We're, we're seeing a lot of uh, folks coming in with bachelor's degrees. Uh, for, for the Coast Guard, the uh, the ASVAB scores at uh, uh, record uh, highs as well. It's at 79 percent and all services are experiencing a 75 percent uh, average ASVAB score. Um, and, and then also the, what's pushing a lot of these people is because you know the, the people that are coming to the Coast Guard right now they, they saw their parents, they saw their siblings um, have to be affected by the economy with you know long drawn out uh, unemployments or underemployments or, or, uh, or with college uh, not uh, fulfilling what they were looking to do. So also, one of the things, unlike our sister services, um, for, the, for Coast Guard newly enlisted personnel, they do not go to an A school or an MOS, MOS school or AIT um, or anything like that to, uh, to learn a specialty. Our E3s and below uh, are typically assigned to a station and to a cutter, and they do uh, general duty work, grunt work, sanding, painting, you know, cleaning bilges, uh, mess cooking, things like that nature. All necessary jobs, obviously. Uh, wait times for A schools right now is uh, 
is at record highs as well. We're, we've got two thirds of our A schools, and there's only 20 of them in the Coast Guard. Uh, they are at four more, four or more years wait times right now. So we're looking at people that are going to do four years in the Coast Guard without even learning a specialty. Is what the, is what they're facing. It's kind of scary to think about that. Um, and, and in order to advance to E4 in the Coast Guard, you have to attend an A school. So with it, also on the advancement side, advancements have slowed down by, by pay grades, specifically E5s and E6s, they've, they've been hit the hardest. They're seeing a one-third decrease uh, in advancements um, as compared to two years ago. Uh, they, you know, they were, you know, if you look at, there's a, uh, uh, a graph there, and it's, you know, pretty steady, and then starting about 2009, 2010, a little downward slant there. Um, so also the Coast Guard, we've also in, uh, initiated or instituted several workforce programs uh, to uh, get advancement moving again. Um, this is, uh, includes reviewing the records of retirement eligible personnel and deciding if we're gonna retain them. If you've got your 20 years in and you haven't uh, been promoted in the last three years, we're, we're gonna see if we wanna keep your servicers or not, you know, because you've already reached, you've already reached that, that 20 year mark. Um, they also, we, we, the Coast Guard just uh, brought back high year tenure as well. Um, and so it's a, a pay grade and time and service based tool to separate members from the service uh, for those who have not advanced in uh, certain pay grades in, in so many years. Um, the, obviously there's going to be checks and balances for these people. It's, uh, it's not going to be as uh, across the board as it was back in the mid 90s. We, we lost a lot of good people back then. This was, uh, you know, especially the, uh, the aviation rating, which is one of the more popular job skills in the Coast Guard. Um, this hopefully will be a little bit more surgical. Uh, is what they're talking about. Um, however, there's going to be, uh, there, there, there will be some cuts. So with our, our enlisted force looking at that, you know, there's definitely lots of angst and pains and, you know, how is this going to impact me questions out there. So, so how do we keep them motivated uh, while these decisions about their careers are being made? Um, first off, we have to communicate. Got to talk to our folks. Got to make sure that they, uh, they understand uh, what's being done, why it's being done, and, and what they can do to, uh, to be part of the, uh, the solution there. Um, Got to have them be proactive in their own career management, and they have to have real expectations and to have contingencies in place. Uh, they got to be prepared to seek out more responsibilities uh, and get out of their comfort zone as well uh, so they can be seen outside the herd. Uh, also need to understand that there's, this is a pendulum effect. Right now we're over here, and hopefully you know, we're going to swing back and you know, it'll be uh, back to the glory days for a couple more years uh, than what's happening right now. Um, and also make sure they understand that it's a, it's a short term thing. Uh, so some of these things the individuals cannot control, however there's a lot that he or she can. Uh, promotion advancements, probably not going to be there right now, this year, next year, um, but the job is. And we do expect performance, uh, you, know, uh, you know, expected level of performance from our personnel. We need good people to continue doing their job. Work productivity cannot diminish during these crucial times. Proficiency. Proficiency, proficiency. Uh, Admiral Papp, Commandant of the Coast Guard, is one of his key words right now is proficiency uh, in service. And this is the key to success. You gotta be able to know your job, do it well, train other people to fill your, uh, fill your roles, you prepare to move up yourself. Um, I, I call this total, cr uh, total craft knowledge is what I like to call this when I talk to my, uh, my crew. Because uh, in the Coast Guard, we're expected to wear several hats um, from you know, law enforcement's conducting boardings on commercial fishing vessels off the coast of North Carolina, to uh, search and rescue cases, uh, and then to, uh, to marine safety, responding to, uh, you know, pollution instances. Um, you know, our uh, frontline troops are making operational decisions every day, and they need to have that proficiency and expertise to, to get it right the first time. So that means they need to seek out qualifications, collateral duties, you know, they can take <laughs> college courses, uh, you know, TA, that was a big uh, dust up there, but, uh, you know, there's uh, been some, uh, some changes and some improvements made, so that's, uh, that's now available once again to um, our, uh, our workforce. Um, and also use their military training to earn licenses. Um, volunteer for those hard jobs uh, or hard to fill assignments, those less than desirable ones. You know, take that uh, position out in Alaska or, or wherever for our Coast Guard personnel. Uh, and also improve your readiness, that's a big thing as well uh, in the Coast Guard, your medical readiness and everything. Uh, physical fitness levels, uh, you know, we're going to be coming with uh, a little bit more uh, stringent physical fitness levels in the Coast Guard. Um, and then also discuss with your supervisor on how to better earn your evaluations. Um, but the biggest thing we need to tell our people is be patient. Got to be patient. Uh, be ready when the pendulum swings back and the log jam clears. You don't want to be caught off guard and not ready to take the advancement test when this happens. 
you know, if anybody that runs uh, 5Ks, 10Ks, or whatever, uh, un unlike those r road races, um, that the clock doesn't stop when your foot crosses a line. The, 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 the clock starts when uh, they need you to start moving. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Trey. Uh, next, I've got Major Jeremy Leshnet, uh, better known as Mad Dog. So you have a killer and a mad dog up here. I'm not too sure what that's all about. But another fighter pilot. Um, Jeremy comes to us as a BS from the Air Force Academy, graduated in 99, F-15 pilot overseas and back here in the United States with deployments in Operation Southern Watch and Operation Noble Eagle. Uh, he's got three master's degrees, uh, MBA, operational art, and philosophy. And he's currently the chief of strategy and planning at Langley Air Force Base. Uh, and when you sit down and you spend some time with Jeremy, you, you get a real sense of somebody who thinks strategically and thinks about innovation. Um, and I truly enjoyed my conversations with him when we weren't moving our hands around. So if I could, uh, uh, Mad Dog, hand it over to you. Uh, thanks, sir. And uh, thanks to you all for coming out here today. As, uh, to say the least, this is far different from what we are all would be normally doing right now at this time. We probably wouldn't have this kind of audience on any given day. So uh, thank you. Uh, total craft knowledge, I, I like that. The number of threats that he accounts for and, and the whole spectrum of threats, vastly different than what I, I'm primarily concerned with on a day-to-day -day basis. And I guess that's a good tee off for what I'd like to uh, throw out there as potential themes for questions. First theme, what I think some of the operational challenges are in the future. Uh, and I'll break that into two, two categories. One, target sets. If we make this assumption that there's type of, types of warfare and then there's going to be a, a counter type of warfare and a counter that type of warfare when I talk about capabilities, uh, that's kind of evolutionary thinking, assuming that there's no game changers like a, a nuclear weapon or something to, of, of that caliber. Uh, we can expect that the enemy is going to counter our successes over the last couple decades. You guys have heard this in other forums uh, already. Well, things I'm considered uh, that we need to think about is what are the characteristics of those target sets and I mean targets for access to a particular area or target sets for achieving objectives and states uh, for the military as well as the political objectives. And I, and I, I kind of break that down and based on all, everything I can get my hands on and obviously the unclass, those, ty those types of characteristics. Ones, I think enemies are going to go underground or below the surface, uh, multiple access, to the sur access points to the surface, resilient command and control, uh, concealment, deception measures, much like uh, the canopies of Vietnam, they're gonna find new ways to counter our ability uh, to find these things. Other type of target set, you're looking at the OODA loop type target sets. Fast, agile, highly mobile, uh, employ while on the move, uh, set up, employ, redeploy, uh, uh, be able to synthesize mission type orders from small pieces of information. So that's one type of th uh, challenge, targets. The other challenge, everybody's already heard about, congested electromagnetic environment. It's the activities that we're up as we operate across the bandwidth. Obviously, some certain spectrums are going to be more uh, congested than others, but it's going to be congested based on the adversary's actions against us and our own uh, uh, actions as we jam ourselves and fight for that uh, for that time to time to talk, speak, and, and, and employ. This brings in this dovetails into the second theme. Primarily concerned about those two challenges on our ability to execute, find, fix, track, target, engage, and assess kill chains. Uh, Obviously, those two challenges have impacts across the board. If you look at our fiscal realities, they obviously uh, create uh, uh, potential new gaps or developing because we may not be able to fund that entire spectrum of dot mil PF capabilities against those kill chains. And then I guess I'll just quickly uh, go into the third theme. Uh, the third theme is if I sp focus specifically on one of the aspects of the kill chain, the engagement uh, function, start looking at some of the challenges that might exist in the future. One is ID. The second one is ROE, and the third one I, I would bring to everybody's attention is probably your decision calculus. Uh, maybe the, some of the ways the lessons learned from the last 10 years of how we operate may have changed or created new paradigms that we maybe have to uh, hard to counter as far as when we, when we hit, the, hit the pickle button or make that decision to do so. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Jeremy. Uh, all the way to my far right is Captain Mike McCrory. Uh, Mike uh, comes to us uh, having had a Bachelor of Arts at Valdosta State in uh, 2005, went to quartermaster school and uh, graduated in 2008, went off to the 1st Heavy, 3rd uh, Infantry Division, uh, and he was an OIF convoy commander for Alpha Company, 3rd Brigade Support Battalion. Um, he's also a maintenance control officer for, uh, for Task Force 1-41 Field Artillery, 
and uh, currently is the uh, company commander for uh, headquarters trade dock and installations at Fort Eustis, and we got to hear his boss today at lunch. Um, again, I asked him, tell me a little bit about uh, yourself and, and some of the excitement you had in his career, and he proceeded to tell me about the IED that went off uh, right behind his vehicle uh, when he was in one of the convoys and about a mortar exploding on the roof of his, uh, at his bunk, uh, bunkhouse when he was in, uh, in country. Um, again, it talks a little bit about each one of the individuals who are with us today. So what I'd like to do is uh, hand it over to Mike. Hey, thank you, sir. Thank you for all being here. Um, operating in a new environment. <laughs> well, if you guys look around, we haven't been in a new environment. We've been in the same environments for the past 10 to 12 years. Uh, and so the challenge I think is going to be posed ahead of us is how do we go forward from this. Uh, looking back on my career and uh, some of the things we did well, as a second lieutenant with brand new soldiers, they had never deployed before, including myself, what, what was I going into? I tapped into the knowledge of my senior non-commissioned officers, my, my senior officers that had already been deployed, and uh, pretty much found out what they were doing then, what the tactics, the techniques, and the procedures that were being done against U.S. forces at the time when they were there, as well as being able to contact my units downrange that we were going to be replacing to find out what was, what was currently being done there, what were our threats that we were running into. And uh, I realized that <coughs> We, uh, as a large platoon that I had, I had 83 soldiers of fuel and water platoon. Well, most of you guys know fuel and water doesn't mix very well. It doesn't burn, and uh, you can't drink it. And so uh, taking these guys and turning them to a force, I found out that we were actually going to be doing convoy security operations, uh, getting downrange. And so my goal was to get these guys out into the field, run into every scenario that we could possibly run into, from setting up evacuation LZs in the middle of a road to uh, occupying and strongholding a building to uh, reacting to IED contacts and 360, uh, 360 security for medevacs. Uh, we did this as much as possible uh, with our timelines that we had. And when we weren't allowed to go out of the field, either due to physical scrutiny or uh, the pressures of uh, training too much, uh, where you're now tying into the family needs of the soldier being at home, uh, I take our guys down to the motor pool and just line up vehicles for a couple hours a week and just rehearse, 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 as uh, uh, the, uh, Marine was saying down at the very end. And uh, we do this over and over again. And then finally, once we had the budget, we were able to go out to a national training center. And the national training center provided us the opportunity to uh, adjust fire on a mission that smells like Iraq, it looks like Iraq. That's where we were going out at Fort Irwin, California. Before us the opportunity when we were running on a mission, and uh, now we get a, a call that we have an ambushed army unit in the middle of a city, and now we've got to go recover them. And I've got the field uh, ambulance to be able to do so. So we uh, adjust fire, go to roll into this video, this town. We don't realize that they're videotaping us. We go in to recover these units, and uh, we're pulling Americans, and their legs are blown off. And granted, they're actors, but they've got blood squirting out of them, and it's complete shock for all my soldiers see this because we this is some of the stuff that you can't train for at home you don't have the resources to train for and so seeing their shock and awe we finally got out of the town with all of our forces well we had taken 18 casualties while we were doing that one mission uh it was a complete ambush it was an ambush after an ambush and then we came back in we, we saw the video of what we had done wrong and uh perception is everything we rolled into this town our guns weren't up uh we weren't staying in our sectors we were in complete shock when we rolled in and the enemy took it to us. We came back, regrouped, hit over our AERs of stuff and our action after action reports of what we could do better. Well, then we came in and we realized for the simplest thing, hey, if we move the vehicle right up next to the casualty, there's no reason to pull three, four guys out of a vehicle to go move one person when we could take two guys out of the back and throw them in the back and get out of the area. And so that type of training that, uh, that was afforded the opportunity to us, allowed us to be more successful when we got into Iraq, and a quicker spin-up time when we were in Kuwait training with some special forces of what is actually going on on the ground right now. And uh, I think we're going to lose sight of that when we go into a new operational environment. The one thing when we go into a new operational environment, I see it more regionally aligned, where uh, we're working with more joint forces, uh, allied forces, uh, there'll be more culture. I, in, in the training document, we're, we're looking at hey, culture experience uh, from our lessons learned from Iraq and Afghanistan. That, that human terrain model uh, plays a very big part in how we can better a country or better an organization or just better a city or a town to, to stay on our side of the fight. And so we're looking at that, and that's where I ultimately see the Army headed. Uh, and 
well, you could say, well, there's a backlog of soldiers coming in. I think it's the same way in the Army. We're having more qualified, skilled people raising their hands saying they want to sign up. And with these more qualified and skilled people, I think it will, there'll be a better adjustment for uh, human train analysis and meeting local governments and having that better interaction and building that uh, lifelong, uh, I guess you can say, friendships and partnerships. Thank you, sir. Okay, Mike, thank you very much. So that's your panel. Um, one individual came from listed ranks, uh, ROTC, OCS, uh, Academy. They've all deployed in combat in their time while they're in the service. Uh, the gentlemen and, and the women who serve with them who aren't on this panel, but they represent uh, those officers who are out there operating forward. What I'd like to do before I ask my first couple questions and before we get to yours is give them a round of applause. Okay. Um, I'm, I looked at my clock. I want to make sure I give you all 20 minutes, so I basically have time for one or two. But the first one I'm going to do is I'm going to point down towards Mad Dog. Uh, what I'd like to do is ask him a question. And basically, as we look at our the current financial situation we're in, in this austere environment, where do you see is the weakest link in the kill chain? And those of you who are familiar with the word kill chain, the kill chain is a series of events that need to happen from the very front end to where you recognize that there's something you need to have an effect on to the very end to where you assess whether you had that effect. Uh, you want to go ahead and get, see if you can uh, address that one for me there, Mad Dog? Uh, obviously, that's the, the, the million dollar questions of where, where is it going to break down? And obviously, when we get to kill chain, we wanna, we're automatically thinking about the capabilities uh, that go into that. And, that. and that is, if you really want to expand the concept all the way from basing, uh, uh, whether it be on a, on a ship for, from the states or forward deployed base, all the way to the point of uh, you know, assessing the effects so that we don't have to go keep dropping the targets 50 times. We know what the effects are if we achieved it or not. The real challenge is gonna be, it's gonna be based on the demands that are continuing to be placed upon us. So if you start thinking we're starting to go to, uh, or we're starting to, to, to go down train where we're, we're balancing modernization, balancing uh, force structure, and you're balancing uh, readiness, we're probably gonna take hits, different levels in each of those categories across the services uh, differently. As we do so, uh, you have to realize that the context of the next situation is going to really going to tell us you know, where we're going to be most vulnerable. If you start looking at you know capacity issues, the force structure that we have, numbers matter, especially if you go into a distance a distance issue. Uh, we've learned that through history, time and time again. Uh, air superiority in a Korean War. Uh, it took us a whole squadrons operating out of Japan just to get a two-hour window of air dominance in in Korea. Well, it turns out. Guess what? The enemy can either focus all their efforts at that one point in time, or they can wait till we go away and then they go. They, they do what they want. So that you can start to see as where capacity obviously dovetails with the capability all of itself. Training issues. We may take a hit in, in readiness, which might, uh, but we may be doing it for the purpose of a, a modernization, so that if we in a limited uh, engagement, we continue to maintain our technological superiority and cross the board here from a joint perspective, so that we can maintain dominance. You want me to, uh, to, to tell you what I think on, on a different venue in a different room with bolted doors? Maybe I could, I could speak a little differently, but I think that kind of generally captures uh, the, my, uh, the, the elements of my thoughts. Okay, thank you, Jeremy. Um, I asked the first question, looked at my watch, it's your turn. I'd like to know if anybody out there has got a question for the panel. Uh, you can cover the topics and the issues that I described in the, in the preamble. Is there anything that you all would like to hear from the operators uh, out in the fleet and the force uh, that they might be able to answer for you? Please. Gentlemen, you'd mentioned a uh, Major Lishnat, you'd mentioned you know, the, the paradigm of you know, possibly being able to like, prosecute a target. Now that we have a more an educated force, a more, a more educated officer corps, even a more educated enlisted corps, how do we go about entrusting those, those service members, the men on the ground, who I would label a game changer, the company grade officers and even the lower field grade officers, how do we go about entrusting them to do the, just that so that something doesn't have to go all the way up to a JTF level and then all the way back down, and then you've missed your opportunity. So how do we go about taking on that challenge? Thank you very much. And who would you like to point that at? Anybody in particular? Just the panel. Just the panel? All right. 
Anybody want to answer that question or at least make a shot at it? Basically, we're talking about our, the force that we have today. How do we uh, entrust them to do the mission without uh, oversight and or, or keep it inside of a tighter loop? Uh, Mike? Sir, I'll take it. Um, as it was going to lead me into a, a question I was going to pose. One, we don't want to micromanage our junior leaders. Uh, it's about knowing your soldier, knowing what motivates your soldier. A, a leader should be able to know how many family members their soldiers have, if they're married, uh, what the relationship is, who they hang out with, uh, what motivates them, and being able to use what motivates them to accomplish the mission. Uh, ultimately, that, if, if you have higher-ups uh, that are dictating, I guess you could say, training that's got to be done, uh, they don't know, I, I would say, I'm not going to say they don't know, but they won't have the crowd, the grit that that, unit, that that junior leader has developed with his soldiers. Um, not saying they won't execute the mission, they will by all means, but when you have that junior leader say, hey, I'm gonna take on this mission, I'm gonna do that, but if you have some, a new guy come in that doesn't have that bond that he's already established with the training, uh, you, you pose a risk uh, there. So, that's... Yeah, please go ahead. So at the JTF and COCOM level, uh, that's going to be hard to do. You know, SANCOM has their requirements. When something happens in their theater, they want uh, to know um, within 60 minutes certain activities. I think you always have to feed the beast, the JTF and the COCOM. But speaking uh, of Marine Corps specifically, I don't think we have that problem. You know, we, we live by centralized planning and decentralized execution. We uh, push down to the lowest level, to our corporal level or E4 level, uh, those decision-making abilities. Um, and we truly train to that, so when we're in combat, we don't have to think about it, we just do it because it's instinct. Um, but at the joint level, it, it is what it is, you gotta feed the beast. And I'm gonna touch on uh, a, a more Coast Guard-centric thing. We, we don't really always deal with the rules of engagement, but we do deal with uh, use of force, especially in our, our law enforcement mission, and we have this thing called a statement of no objection, that when we are going to apply use of force, um, we've, uh, over the years, we've delegated that further and further down to our small boat coxswains <laughs> and to our pilots, uh, especially when it comes to the uh, aviation use of force. Um, so for, for me, it, it's, a, it's a matter of training. Um, you know, have we, tra have we trained our personnel and have we applied the, uh, the decision-making matrix uh, to them and do they understand that? Is that clear? Has it been cleared through, you know, from, you know, through, com you know, uh, commands, combatant commands, JTFs, or even also, uh, for, on our side, we have to uh, look at the, uh, the legal aspect as well. And so it's really uh, training and how well, how well your people are trained and, you know, if, you're, uh, if the mission uh, is required for that type of force. Okay, thank you. Paul? I'd say um, it, it has to come from the top down. A lot of problems we find is that in this new environment of new technology, we have all these communications available to us. When I have to provide a 60 gigabyte video of some ship I saw out on the sea up to higher headquarters to make an evaluation, you've completely cut the legs out from under that commander. Um, not to mention it's incredibly limiting. Uh, the, what you may have back in Bahrain or whatever uh, command center is not what you have on a ship. And we find ourselves uh, tr trying to do the best we can, but it's not always the case. So from way up high, they're already under undercutting you. Um, I, I guess I would say the best you could do is, uh, you know, down at my lowly level, do the best I can to empower my sailors at a low level. And hopefully there's a trickle up mentality there. All right, thank you. And I, I think there's a piece of a spectrum of warfare there too, depending on, on whether you're in a position where the warfare is very low level and there's time to the point where you're reacting instinctively in combat, as I think you were just talking about a couple of seconds ago, that, uh, that that's what's gonna drive some decision-making instinct and the training that you've had and how you, how you respond. Um, I think the longer you have to think about things, and sometimes the more oversight you get. Uh, any other questions out there? Anybody else have somebody that wanna ask the panel? Please. Good afternoon to you, too. Uh, if you speak up loudly, I can go. repeat it. There you go. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Um, my backstory: I served eight years in the Marine Corps, uh, got out as a sergeant. I served in the infantry. And I'm going to bring up something that I struggled with personally, my peers struggled with it, and many of my junior officers as well that I served under. 
We talked about how many of you have mentioned the economic situation driving recruiting, uh, as well as troop welfare becoming a, a more widely accepted primary concern. Um, is it becoming more difficult to focus your NCOs and your junior service members on mission accomplishment rather than benefits and family preparedness, things of that nature, while in their newly lengthened garrison statuses? And is the training tempo adequate to balance that? Okay, you've broken just a little bit in the middle of the question, and I think you're asking, is it difficult to focus your, your, uh, your troops? And then what was the next piece? Is it difficult to focus your, your troops on mission accomplishment as the primary ends to means, rather than focusing on their benefits and their family right. preparedness plans and things like that? Okay, that, that's a fair question. Thank you very much. Does anybody you want to aim that at? Not the Marine? <laughs> Anybody up here like to take that one on? Well, it looks like he's volunteered to, uh, to answer your question. I think it's about balance excellence. Um, again, it, it's not one or the other. Um, I think, you know, as, as a Marine, you know, you know we're all about mission accomplishment, right? And I think all the services are like that as well. Uh, but the balance excellence, the other side of the equation, is that family readiness, is the benefits, is, you know, everything you're entitled to. Um, because when you're downrange, as you know, uh, the less you have to worry about at home, the more successful you are in the battlefield. And that starts with building that foundation during your pre-deployment training before you deploy. Um, so in, in my personal experience, um, you know, we've had really good uh, COs and sergeant majors and first sergeants that made sure that we did achieve that balance excellence before we went downrange. Um, and then when we were deployed, we never really had too many issues with you know, Marines thinking about home issues. They, they always came up but we were able to get the mission done at the end of the day. Okay, thank you very much, Glenn. Trey? Uh, as a uh, unit commanding officer right now, um, for, for me, mission accomplishment always comes first. Um, it, it has to, that's what we signed up for, that's what we've raised up our right hands, that's what uh, we agreed to do, it's part of uh, the, the employment promise that we made. Um, and, you know, benefits, they're, they're, they're recruiting tools. Um, but uh, you know, talking with my crew, talking with my uh, uh, you know my peers that are in the uh, same position I am, you know, we, we have a lot of people that uh, you know uh, you know have the, the what's in it for me mentality, um, and and that's okay because we all have different motivating factors, whether it's you know money or you know um, you know earning ranks, getting schooling, anything like that. Um, but uh, you know, sometimes the the mission's going to have to take take priority, um, and then once you get to for you know, and I'll use the Coast Guard for example. Um, most people on a cutter in the Coast Guard are unable to take uh, online classes and use tuition assistance. Um, it's just we we just don't have the uh, the capabilities on ship. Our our computer network system that we have cannot do it. You know, we just don't have the bandwidth or anything like that. And I'm not a, a technical guy when it comes to that stuff. Um, so, you know, we have to tell them, you're going to have to wait till you, till you get to a shore assignment to be able to do it, you know. So while you're on the ship, focus on this. Focus on getting your quals. Focus on, you know, earning these, uh, you know, these, um, you know, g getting advanced to the next pay grade or something like that. Because then when you get to your land assignment, you can, that's when you can focus on your off-duty education and your, you know, other things as well. So it's, it's, it's you know, it's, it's a juggling act. Welcome to life. Okay. Thank you, Trey. Okay, Mike. Hey, sir. Um, I, I think the Army does a very well jo a good job of balancing uh, our, our community service uh, ties with, uh, and when I say Army community service, I'm looking at you know, our behavioral health, our mental health, uh, behavioral health services, the stuff that we are entitled to, the briefings that you get with uh, everything that's going on with the installation, the services that we have, financial services that are offered. Uh, we have days that we will stand down a whole day and allow these services to come on to post or uh, the ones that are already on to post and set up shop and invite the families to come down so they can at least have these one-on-one -on -one talks or set up appointments with the legal services and whatnot to, uh, to better set up the soldier. And so and when we deploy downrange, now, uh, I know it not at first, but now we have centers where people, soldiers can go do courses online. Uh, when we first started the war, we didn't have this opportunity, but uh, most of these larger bases, I mean, soldiers have the opportunities to go out there and get it. And uh, luckily, we have a lot of senior officers or even junior leaders and uh, senior NCOs that have already done it, and they're there to help mentor them. Okay, thank you very much. I'm going to go into the next question, if I could, please. 
Thank you. My question is to the panel as a whole. Yesterday on that same stage in the panel on operating in a constrained environment, we had a lot of uh, people with stars on their shoulders. And they all had as a common theme one of the major challenges is understanding commander's intent and issues with how to get people to understand commander's intent. I, I asked you to comment on, none of you mentioned commander's intent. Okay, so I think you asked, um, you asked the panel whether they understood their commander's intent? No, it, perspective of the senior leadership is that's mm -hmm. a major issue. From the operations perspective, it didn't come up at all. I'm, I'm seeing a big gulf between their perspective and what we heard from the senior leadership on terms of what are the issues around commander's intent. And so the question is? Is, do they see that gulf? Is commander's intent understanding it an issue? Okay, so, so do you all see a gulf between commander's intent and how you see what your mission is? Does anybody want to take that one on? Please, go ahead. I guess if you want to put it in context of where you are in the, in the ladder of who's commander's intent, is this information being relayed to these guys in terms of what their people are feeding them that they're not getting enough? I would say is uh, uh, from at, at my level, uh, you know, everybody's right now, as we, you're starting to shrink and there's more uncertainty, and there's more churn, there's a lot more time dedicated to problem solving and, and, and decision making, the crank of everyday activities, the fight for the, the time for the commander to really convey what he wants and set those visions out, which take a lot more time. Takes a, you can do it very succinctly. The message can be succinct, but to develop it, a really focused mission for your organization, whether it be in warfare or whether it be in, in, in the uh, peacetime management, et cetera, it takes time to develop that message and then to convey it succinctly and first time around so you don't have to keep reiterating it across multiple channels. Same challenges in warfare. Uh, that may be one of, the, one of the ones that they may be getting from the, the challenges above them as well as what they're perceiving from below them. And I think it's really, that is a symptom of, of a time component and a shortage of resources. Okay, thanks Jeremy. Go ahead, Paul. I think as uh, we take on more and more missions and the pendulum swings from HADR and helping people to kinetic warfare that more and more it, it's just uh, maybe too much at times, and whereas it used to be as easy as your orders were, go blockade this port, and that was it, it, it just keeps growing. So how do you balance those two? Um, I don't know, I think it goes back to training, being, having the people to execute the commander's intent, uh, but sometimes it's, it's not possible. And uh, we've grown from an area where uh, our orders were a lot more simple to a time when we're expected to do 10 different missions instead of one. I think that's where the, the delta might be in the, the rub. Okay, thanks Paul. Uh, I think we've got time for one more question. Go ahead. Thanks gentlemen. Uh, what's your biggest day-to-day -day frustration? If you had the opportunity or ability to do so, how would you go about changing that? That's so for everybody. The question is what's their biggest frustration? Biggest day-to-day -day frustration and if you had the power to do so, how would you go about changing that in your specific line of work? Okay, I think that's a great question, uh, and that was going to be my wrap-up to give this panel the last word. Uh, so, so if you don't mind, we'll make that the last question, and I think the way I was going to word it up is if you have one piece of advice for leadership, what would you not do or not do? So what's your greatest frustration and how would you solve that? I think it's probably just the same kind of question. So I'm going to ask each one of these individuals up here to, uh, to take a shot at that, and I gave them a chance to think about it, so hopefully it won't, won't be too long of an answer, though. I'm going to start off with you, Glenn. Thank you, sir. As the Marine Corps downsizes from 2021 to 182, uh, two, um, and we look to shape the force, um, I just hope that we continue to look at what our core competency is as a Marine Corps. Um, you know, a lot of panels this week obviously are focused on cyber, um, and the money we know is in soft and cyber. But you know, in my opinion, and I think the Commandant's opinion is, you know, we do crisis response. We're forward deployed naval force aboard naval shipping, and we uh, deploy expeditionary. Uh, you know, we give the uh, leaders in Washington decision space uh, in order to make decisions and allow follow-on forces to come in. So I hope that as budgetary issues or, or pressures continue to, to uh, uh, push the Marine Corps and the Naval Service down, both in terms of our force structure and ships, I hope that uh, we don't lose that core competency that has made us um, the Marine Corps. Rock. Okay, thank you very much, Glenn. That's great advice, Paul. I think uh, my biggest frustration is the, the schedule is not mine. 
Um, I, I have things I want to do, I have training I want to do, but I have so many people coming around to train me that I'm not able to do it. So you, you have to just give up control to off-ship entities, and if there was one off-ship entity, my boss above me, that'd be fine, but there, I, I have eight bosses, Bob. So um, it, it gets difficult trying to keep track of that. If up above the schedule was intact and we had a clear-cut path to success and deployment, that'd be great. Uh, but right now, the, my schedule isn't mine. Okay, Paul, thanks, and uh, wondering which one of your bosses told you to be here for this panel. If, uh, Trey, go ahead. I, I think right now my, uh, I guess my biggest day-to-day -day frustration is, is, is twofold. Um, the first one is going to be uh, in the Coast Guard where they're, they're preaching uh, standardization. It's something that came out of the aviation community. Uh, that's one of the reasons why um, our aviators were able to be very successful during uh, rescue operations in Katrina. Um, you know, they, they were able to bring uh, helicopter crews from all the way to Alaska. To, uh, to, to New Orleans and uh, jump in an airplane and, 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 you know, with a hodgepodge crew from all four corners of the, of the country and do that. Uh, however, I'm in a community where standardization is still a very foreign concept um, as far as, you know, if you go on board, uh, you know, on the, on the, the ship that I'm on and, and you look at the, the ship right next to us, we're completely different uh, in the way that we're, uh, um, you know, from uh, you know, aesthetics to, you know, just the little nuances. We have the same engines, we have all that good stuff, but just the way we do things as far as, you know, light off procedures, you know, staining the watches, you know, all that stuff. So standardization or the lack of standardization in the, the, uh, the community that I'm in is a big thing. Um, and, uh, the, the, and, not being, and, and not looking for a way to make that um, a realization. Uh, and, and then the other frustration is redundant inspections. Um, you know, we, I just uh, had uh, a weapons uh, inspection last week, and then this week I had a law enforcement inspection where we had some of the same stuff. And then, uh, uh, you know, each year I get, a, I get evaluated by my sector, and then I have uh, another inspection team that does, like a nationwide uh, inspection team, comes and does the same thing. So, so redundant inspections would be uh, top of my list. Okay, thanks, Trey. Uh, Mad Dog, over to you. Uh, I would have to say to be a, a deliberate with your schedule in terms of a time allocated for thought, research, doing analysis, and then ultimately uh, making decisions. That's the, 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 the easy, seems to be the easiest and quickest uh, uh, work. Each of those has a different heartbeat, takes different time. My, you know, my counterparts, uh, we left at 7. I left at 7 last night uh, from work. He was going to leave probably about 1 a.m. That's vastly different from uh, when we have a three-hour day and we're out underneath the, the, the tree with the apples talking about long-term visions. So you can see the deliberate time differences there. My bosses are really good about doing it. And they're really good about uh, affording me the time to do it. There's times when it's crank, 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 and then there's times where we have to set aside time. Otherwise, we're not going to get the innovative thought. We're not going to get the or innovative thinking. We're not going to get the, the right players in the room and, and, and make the right relationships happen uh, so that we can... Uh, uh, give us the best visions for success, we can give that commander's intent out. All right, thank you very much. And Mike, you get the last word. Uh, yes, sir, I mean, all of our services, we're a melting pot. We got people from all over the United States coming into the service, every religion. Uh, people that know these soldiers best are gonna be the junior leaders. Let the leaders lead. Don't micromanage us, let us do our job, let us report up to you. Uh, it doesn't look good when we have senior leaders coming down in front of junior leaders. Uh, if it is, it needs to be taken behind closed doors. Uh, so that, that's all I have to say, sir. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I think this has been an awesome panel. I'd like us all to give them a round of applause if we could, please. <laughs>